Okay, welcome to this webinar uh, with the Child Welfare Information Technology Systems Managers and Staff Webinar Series. Um, this webinar is presented by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families, Children's Bureau. Um, today's webinar um, titled Court and Child Welfare Data Exchange, Better Information for Improved Outcomes. will feature um, our court improvement program as well as the uh, Capacity Building Center for Courts. And we will also have panelists um, representing the state of Georgia and the state of, of Washington. Um, so welcome all of you. Um, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, today's presenters will be Scott Trowbridge, who um, is the Child Welfare Program Specialist for the Court Improvement Program at Administration for Children and Families. Um, Alicia Davis, who's a pr principal court management consultant at the National Center for State Courts and the Center, the Capacity Building for Courts. Um, it will also feature Cindy Bricker, who is the Court Improvement Program Director um, uh, and from Washington, and Matt Orn, who is a Senior Research Associate at the Administrative Office of the Courts, and Tammy Cordova, who is a Data and Reporting Administrator at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families in Washington State. It'll also feature our panelists from Georgia, uh, Jerry, Judge Jerry Bruce, who's the Court Improvement Program Manager, as well as Wendy Wilson, who is the CWIS project manager. And I'm your webinar facilitator. My name is Phil Breitenbusher, and we're glad you have joined us. And we would really encourage participation today, and there's multiple ways in which you can participate in today's webinar. Uh, one is that we will periodically pause and um, take questions and, and, and answers, and try to provide questions and answers um, as we go through this segment. Um, you can also submit your questions uh, and comments via the chat function. Um, or uh, again, we can open up the lines. Uh, you can use the raise your hand feature and we can admit your line that way. Um, questions can be addressed to an individual, uh, to, um, to a panelist, or just general discussion. Um, after the webinar, you may also email questions to your federal analyst or to cwis.questions at acf.hhs.gov. Um, so we do want to encourage active engagement and participation in our discussion today. Uh, broadly, we're going to uh, start with an overview of the Court Improvement Program. Um, we'll have a national perspective there from Scott. Um, then we're going to have a discussion on opportunities uh, for collaboration through data sharing presented by Alicia Davis. And then our panelists will discuss opportunities to uh, build relationships as a foundation for data information exchange, um, building information exchange models and public facing data dashboards. Uh, we'll conclude today with some final thoughts and a, and a wrap up. All right, we're gonna move now into our um, first speaker. So I'm glad to present to you, uh, Scott. Scott, take it away. Hello all. Um, we wanted to start with an overview of the State Court Improvement Program, or I will say CIP most of the time. This may be review for some of you, um, but even there, I hope that by outlining what CIPs are charged to do, you can be thinking of areas where you may have similar um, data uh, needs, uses, insights, and above all, ideas for opportunities to work together. So the CIP was established as part of the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 that will be on the quiz later. And that act overall provided funds to states and tribes for child maltreatment, prevention, and response. For the CIP part, the highest court in each jurisdiction is eligible for those funds. And most of these are called um, and within the administrative office of the courts in the most places called state supreme court. So the CIP uh, is granted in three parts, basic, training, and data. And basic is broadly court improvement for child welfare. The other parts are generally and broadly what you'd guess from being called training and data. Currently, every state, D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands have 
these grants. And I'll just say state to save time, um, if you can excuse that simplification. Um, next slide, please. Overview of the core improvement program. So I'm going to go over the purposes and the practice um, orientation. So the reason I hope this is useful again is for you to be able to think about ways that CWIS and CIP could be working together. So here are the broad purposes of CIP from the regs and program instructions as I summarize them. CIP is focused on certain outcomes, on safety, permanency, well-being, and due process. CIP is focused on certain domains or spheres or disciplines, for lack of a word, um, perhaps better than that, the, those domains of the legal community, judges, lawyers, and court staff, and legal processes, including those involving others like caseworkers and their interactions with uh, the court, for example. There are two required projects a joint project with the Child Welfare Agency and a hearing quality project. And next year, I anticipate there will be a required legal representation project. And uh, maybe not a purpose, but there is a requirement in significant projects to, and ideally in all efforts to some reasonable extent, to operate, or under, operate the CAP under a continuous quality improvement framework. So in the next slide, I'll explain what we mean by that. The Continuous Quality Improvement, CQI for short, is a mouthful of words for something that's simple to understand but hard to do in practice in big complex systems. It's a change management model, a cyclical conception that goes from, one, identifying and assessing strengths and needs, two, developing a theory of change or really more properly a hypothesis of uh, the chain of causation that will get you from your intended initial systemic change to your desired outcomes. Phase three is developing, fleshing out the intervention that will make that change. Part four is planning, preparing, implementing that intervention. And five, evaluating whether you really did the intervention faithfully, we might call fidelity, and checking on both short and long-term outcomes. So. The reason I go into this one in more detail is because I would assert that, and we and C, CAPs hear this from us too, that every step of the cycle benefits from data and data expertise. I think in phase one, identifying and assessing needs, and in phase five, evaluation, there's a more intuitive importance of looking at the data involving data experts. But what I'd assert is that there's a lot of intervention design, implementation, and planning in between that, that the experts on the state data could provide insight to or benefit from being a part of. So, you know, aside from the topical focus of the CAPs, I would think about, you know, where in the cycle and are you being um, taking advantage of opportunities there? And are CAPs taking opportunities there to work with you? So, um, in a lot of cases, we see the core data or insights um, that could be shared with you and better understand you know, why you are seeing what you're seeing in your data. And we also see the other way of core, examples of core partnerships improving data quality, for example, around uh, 4E findings. So those, next slide please, those are in a nutshell the broad topical purposes and process approach of the state CIPs. For a little more detail, we won't take too long on this, but we do gather and aggregate aggregate national data on the CAP work annually. And oh, next slide, please, sir. And so we gather national data on the CIP work, and there are some additional snapshots of what they were working on from last year's info. Almost all of them are working on a data project. Um, which is may not be CWIS data, of course. Uh, it could be manual. It could be, you know, collecting uh, court hearing data. So you also see timeliness, permanency there, which is surely something you are also looking at. Um, engagement of parties is a good one to focus on because that's an area crucially often the courts and agencies both have just part of the puzzle in their data sets. 
there are more that didn't make the top categories, and we could, you know, if you're if you're interested in this type of thing, we could make that national report available to you if you liked um, that this comes from. Um, next slide, please. So further breaking out the data projects, you'll see that the largest percentage of these are agency data sharing efforts, and second is case management systems. I would say, um, and one of the things I was I was focusing on when this idea of this webinar is proposed is that I think a lot of the data sharing projects are not as automated as I would like. Um, on the other hand, comparing 10 to 12 years ago when I first started working with CIPs, the amount of sharing of any type, uh, including you know manual, it's like sharing at meetings, it's up a lot. So I'd um, I'd also note that a lot of the sharing projects might not be child welfare agency and courts. Um, they could be with education or juvenile justice, for example. But that's some other breakdowns of the data initiatives and capacity building needs. And another thing, yeah, back to that next slide, please. So we asked what areas they needed assistance with globally, and number one was data uh, collection and analysis. In the top five was data visualization and reporting. So I imagine that many of you have skills in those areas that would be most welcome if you could take on a shared venture with CIPs. Next slide. So what are the possibilities? I, I hope it's helpful for you to understand what CIPs are charged to do. You'll hear some examples of where, in my opinion, there are great benefits to the courts and the agency and, of course, the children and families from collaboration around and including data. So I encourage you to think about where you might see a bridge, whether it's topical or some process where you could work with the CIP. Um, as you know, as you probably know, the CFR does promote the bi-directional data exchanges between CWIS and the courts. and um, Without calling out CWIS specifically, there there is, you know, uh, direction to CIPs in their program instruction to reach out um, and to the agency uh, about uh, data and sh and of course, you know, there's that's part of the data grant and part of the uh, joint project uh, potentially in a lot of states. So if you have uh, specific questions, reach out to your assigned federal analyst. They can um, reach out to us if. Anything was needed um, on you know getting things rolling or introductions made, etc. It's um, you know better to ask, and we'll see how we can be helpful. So for more depth on the parameters of getting started and making data exchange work, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia Davis, who, when Phil and Nicole proposed this topic to me, was one of the first persons I thought of. So I've had the pleasure of working with her for. I think a dozen years, and on a lot of the topics above that I just uh, went through quickly, um, she could say a lot about her background, but I'll say for um, quickly that she speaks at least four languages fluently, legalese, data, English, and Spanish. So <laughs> with, take it away, Davis. Oh, thank you so much, Scott. Yeah, we, we go back a long time. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to take part of this panel. Um, as Scott knows, I am a very enthusiastic, sometimes annoyingly so, supporter of data exchange between CWIS and CIP. Um, and the reason that I am is because my experience is that it has, it has been the vehicle to springboard collaboration. And as Scott was saying, you know, partnerships really improve data quality. And I would say that also, you know, that data quality um, improves the partnerships. Um, so as, as Scott mentioned, um, you know, I've, I've been with the Capacity Building Center for, for six years. Um, and I'm the, the Region 2 liaison. And I've been involved in a number of joint projects of the type that, that Scott was just referencing. So like the CFSR and PIP workshops that really count on data sharing, taking a look at you know, the information that is at the hands of, of CWIS and the court systems and, and requires the type of collaboration that Scott was, was talking about. 
So um, I've, you know, I've been at the National Center for State Courts for about 10 years, working on a lot of different national data sharing projects. But before that, I served as the Court Improvement Director for Colorado and the director for CIP in Utah before that. And um, those of you familiar with those states know that they are states that are really invested in CWIS and court data exchange and data sharing. Um, and as a result of that, I would say that those jurisdictions have accomplished some, some, pretty, some pretty great outcomes um, for you, some pretty great attention for the children and families that they're serving. So next slide, um, just as an example of my former days in Colorado, uh, we were very proud of the family justice information system that was an information sharing effort between um, the Colorado Department of Human Services and the courts um, that Mm, that kind of ugly thing that you see there is the wheel of FAMGIS. Um, it was one of the ways that we tried to fun it up when we would do joint trainings to ensure that um, on the CWI side and on the court side that everybody was entering the right codes. And those are all the codes that you can see represented on the wheel there in order to improve data quality and, you know, be able to get better information out of it. Um, in terms of the next slide, court agency data exchange. Scott, I think you had something to say about this. Scott may be muted. So um, I, think, I think the point here is that automated court systems have, you know, obviously they have a lot of information about the rights of the parties, emergency hearing dates, you know, the dates of all different reviews and hearings. Um, there, you know, obviously a lot of, uh, it can be very helpful because the court documents may or may not have the most current address of the parties. So that's obviously information that can be helpful to share information about the attorneys that are assigned to the case. Um, the, you know, the, the, of, co of course, the different elements of, you know, the permanency um, dates, according to the courts, we know that sometimes that doesn't always necessarily square up with what the agency has on record. Record, um, and that becomes a whole conversation between the courts and the agency and can be really helpful in terms of, you know, determining what the what each party's respective data definitions are and sort of generating a conversation about what permanency really means. And then as we'll be hearing from some of the jurisdictions that are represented on the panel today, by squaring up those definitions, really, you know, engaging in a shared focus on on those on permanency and other outcomes. Next slide. So in saying all of this, um, I recognize as you know, as is represented in this cartoon here, where the one guy is saying, sometimes I think that collaboration would work better without you. And I know that that is often the experience. And so we just want to recognize that that what we're talking about is not, it's, it's not easy, it, it can require some effort, um, especially if you've had turnover in your jurisdiction, maybe, you know, there was a court leader that you were working really well with, and then that person left, or they've taken on a new assignment. Um, it can be difficult to start all over again to get the buy-in and the vision for what can be accomplished through this. And, you know, and, and I, I've heard stories and, you know, and I, I hate to hear these stories of, of just, you know, people reaching out to courts and hearing that, you know, that this aspect of court functioning represents a percentage of what the court does. Um, we all certainly recognize the importance of it. But the thing that I would, would again say is that, you know, sometimes it requires a lot of effort, but in terms of the, the benefits, once you do get to that place of shared vision, it can really reap some tremendous benefit. And on the next slide, again, kind of hearkening back to what Scott was saying, if you had talked to, I've been, you know, I've been working with court improvement programs for over 15 years now. And I, you know, I was a, a parent's um, attorney before that. Um, you know, it's just a different environment now than it was 10, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, whereas it used to be really interesting to be involved in agency data discussions because they were very robust. And then, you know, the court um, discussions were sometimes less so. You know, as, as Scott showed in the slides, that's really changing and people are 
actively seeking assistance and in, in how to collect and then interpret and use the data that they were getting. So on the next slide, I, as a final kind of note, um, I hope that maybe this has crossed your desks at some point. And if it has, I would, I would like to hear if it's been of use at all. Um, it's a document that I got to collaborate on, just talking about some of the elements of data sharing. It gives a couple of examples of memoranda of understanding between um, CWIS and courts. So um, on the next slide, with regards to the Capacity Building Center for Courts, as Scott will tell you and has mentioned, each state has a liaison. As I mentioned, I'm in region two, but there's a liaison for every single region. And, and these are people that, you know, are really steeped in CQI and in um, trying to support communications and partnership between the agency and the courts. Scott? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's that's a good highlight, but just to know that there's this other um, technical assistance provider there, and, you know, most of these folks are uh, attorney, have attorney backgrounds and have a lot of child welfare specialization, but in a lot of cases, they are brought on because they have additional expertise in other areas. Um, as such, they might cross over regional lines depending on the subject matter, like Alicia, for example. She is a regional liaison, but she's also worked on that technical guide she mentioned and could be brought in for data-related re consultation um, as needed. Um, and reaching out to your, your assigned analyst is, is one way to connect there. Um, I think we also have our contact information in there as well. Um, Aside from the newest uh, liaisons that are just starting, they've all worked extensively with CIPs and child welfare agencies, so they'd, they'd be good resources uh, also for, you know, the type of introductions and just understanding um, uh, some about the states and where they're at with different things. Um, so either from that or subject matter expertise or work group facilitation, um, it's probably easier just to, to share with us what the need is for me then for me to list all the ways they could be helpful in um, in your states. So I would just offer that as a resource that is potentially there for you. All right, next, that's our contact information. I assume this uh, presentation is going out to everybody. And now I believe we're uh, turning it back to Phil. Yeah, thank you so much. And we're gonna move to uh, a period of questions. Uh, we noticed that there was a question that, uh, or a request that the URL, URL be uh, made available um, um, that was on the slide deck. Um, we can, um, maybe Alicia can put that in the, in the chat box, uh, but you can also email Alicia there at adavis at ncsc.org and she'd be happy to share it with you that way. Um, Nicole, do we have any other questions at this time? Phil, give me one second. The chat line just went off. Okay. Oh, sir, we do not have any. We do not have any other questions right now. Thank you, sir. Right. Yes, thanks, Nicole. And I see Alicia, you have posted that link as well there. Um, so go ahead and um, feel free to download that toolkit. It's an excellent resource. Um, and again, thank you very much, Scott and Alicia. Um, we really appreciate uh, that introduction to the Court Improvement Program. Uh, now um, uh, we're going to shift into part two with our state panelist discussions. And we're going to start off with our folks from Washington, um, again, which is, uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves as they speak. Um, and I'll turn it first over to Tammy. Uh, next slide, Bill. Thank you. And uh, my name is Tammy Cordova, and I'm the data and reporting administrator for the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, which is the child welfare agency in Washington State. I'm responsible for agency reporting and data sharing. Uh, my team works closely with our CWIS team and our court data partners. And today, I'm going to briefly tell you the story of how our child welfare agency started working with the courts to share data. Uh, next slide. First, I wanna give you some context about how the child welfare system and the court system intersect in Washington State. Uh, so Washington is a state administered child welfare system with six regions and 51 field offices. The map you can see on the screen shows the six regions in different colors, uh, very different sizes depending on east and west of the state. Uh, 
And the smaller borders reflect the 39 counties in Washington. Tribal lands are shown in the teal color and some tribes have their own tribal courts. Our dependency courts are uh, situated in the counties and our child welfare offices do not always align uh, exactly with counties. In urban areas, we have multiple offices in large counties and our rural offices often uh, cover multiple counties. We have a decentralized county-based court system, which presents some challenges in terms of sharing data, as each court may function very differently. However, we're very fortunate to have statewide court leadership through the Administrative Office of the Courts, which we call AOC. Our other two panelists from Washington work for AOC, and you'll get to hear about the work they're doing. Uh, you are going to hear the term dependency or dependent child during this presentation. Uh, in Washington, this term is used to indicate a child who's placed into the placement and care authority of the child welfare agency by the court. So that's clear. Uh, next slide. In 2007, a state law required AOC in consultation with our child welfare agency and the attorney general's office to compile an annual report uh, that provided information about dependent children whose cases did not meet statutory guidelines for achieving permanency. As we looked at that, it quickly became clear that Child Welfare Agency had data that we needed to share with the courts in order to understand permanency outcomes at the broader uh, system level. We executed a data share agreement and shared the child welfare data so it could be merged with court data to tell the broader story of the child welfare system. And the very first report established the shared ownership for improved outcomes by the courts, child welfare agencies, attorneys, parents, and service providers. And we went along that route for uh, four years and then in uh, two, 2011, the uh, AOC Center for Court Research, which was responsible for the report, hired Matt Orm, who you will hear from next. Matt had worked with data in our child welfare system for 20 years, both in our research shop and for me in our data shop. Because Matt understood the child welfare data, he was able to make use of the merged data that we already had and produce additional useful content much quicker. Um, and as you all know, the 2016 CWIS rules added the requirement of three new interfaces to uh, electronic child welfare system, one being the court interface, which uh, will complement Washington's already existing requirement to share data between child welfare programs and the courts. Uh, data sharing is all, often the biggest hurdle to establishing new electronic inf interfaces, um, and Washington has already successfully navigated that hurdle, so we feel like uh, that's a big step forward for us. We still have some technological challenges that need to be worked through in order to develop the interface uh, between our CWIS system and the court system, which Matt will touch on in his presentation. Um, the 2007 state law served as an opportunity um, because we were mandated to produce an annual report. Uh, however, we've leveraged that mandate to do much more, which we'll show you in just a couple minutes. Next slide. So we have learned some lessons over the last 13 years. And the first is to develop repeatable processes. Our current process for exchanging and merging the data is very dependent on Matt's knowledge of child welfare data. So we're excited as we move forward to automate this exchange um, through our CWIS process. Uh, and we know this will streamline our data exchange process, making it much more efficient, economical, and effective. It will allow the courts and a child welfare agency to focus more of our efforts on using the data. In addition, uh, which we don't have now, bringing the court data back into our CWIS system will reduce caseworker data entry workload and lag time 
and allow caseworkers to focus on improved outcomes for children and families. Um, another lesson we learned is that it is very important to develop documentation that translates the terms and field names between systems. Uh, quite honestly, uh, we have to admit that we didn't take the time to do that. And I still have to call Matt occasionally and ask what some fields mean in the merged data because the terms are quite different between the court and the child welfare system. Uh, having two primary agencies reach agreement about how best to share the data and make use of it was not always painless. Uh, it was made easier by Matt's knowledge of both systems. However, we were doing it for four years before Matt was hired by the courts, just in case any of you were thinking you need to go hire someone from the court system in order to do this. Uh, it is possible and it really is worth it. We expect the use of the data to continue it to evolve from what it is today in supporting improved practice. It provides a common framework where child welfare workers, attorneys and judges can all look at the same information and work together toward improved outcomes. Our last presenter today is going to share some examples of the collaborative and constructive work being done in Washington because we have this merged data. But now I'm going to turn this over to Matt Orm, who's the Senior Research Associate from AOC's Center for Court Research. And he's going to tell you about the data products we've developed using the merged data. Uh, and uh, there you go, Matt, thanks. Thanks, Tammy. And thank you, Phil, and all for inviting Washington to participate in today's presentation. I'm gonna quickly cover how our current data exchange process works, and then share a few of our data products that support Washington in using better information for improved outcomes. Next slide, please. So a little bit about our current data exchange process. First, removal and placement data are extracted from the DCYF FamLink data system. This data is then used to match back to Washington's Superior Court Management Information System, or what we call SCOMIS. Once matches have been identified, indicating that a person with the same name, gender, birth date was associated in both systems, a complex date time routine is done to associate the best fit family placement to the SCOMIS court case. This is necessary as a child could have many placements over time as well as many court cases. Once the child has been matched on a court case and a placement, then the necessary family data is merged to the court record for analysis and reporting. Next slide, please. So here are just some um, simple screenshots from our dependency timeliness report that we do annually or what we call the DEETER. So upper left is uh, a representation of what's in the middle of our report. Um, this is illustrating the Washington State Family and Juvenile Court Improvement Program, which Cindy's gonna talk about. As you move across the top, there are sections related to case volumes and filing trends per population, et cetera. And then we have big sections related to what we call our timeliness measures or timeliness indicators. This one is for fact finding or time from dependency petition to adjudication. Um, lower left, we have lots of breakouts related to placement discharge types, um, events, uh, time to those events, dismissals, et cetera. And then in the back of our report, it's a complete county based section where we have lots of breakouts per our 39 counties. This happens to be for Pierce, illustrating a couple sections related to their performance indicators or timeliness indicators, outcomes, demographics, um, their filings, re-entries into the systems, et cetera. Next slide, please. So our public facing dependency dash dashboard, we use uh, Tableau in creating this. It contains monthly and quarterly aggregate displays for all of our timeliness, timeliness measures indicators for all our counties as well as a previous year roll up for a comparative reference and a previous year roll up for all the measures broken out by race and ethnicity. So again, these are just some simple little screenshots um, from the website, the public website. On the left-hand side, a simple little county map. When you're online, you can hover over or select any of those counties. All of their permanency uh, indicators come up, timeliness indicators, filing indicators. Down the center, you can kind of see 
as much as we could fit on the screenshot. Um, uh, measures per county on the right hand side are some simple examples of some maps related to demographics across the state. And again, dependency filings and rates per county. Next slide, please. So our internal interactive dependency timeliness reporting system, or what we call the iDeter, contains everything the Deter does, plus more in an interactive setting. It's a web-based application housed securely on our internal court server. And this reporting tool allows users to view data on timeliness and court processing for the state their county or any other county. And these simple screenshots uh, upper left are showing uh, a federal approach for the termination of parental rights within 15 months. You can see in the blue box, um, you can filter for any county in the state, gender, race, ethnicity. It's broken down over time for compliance and non-compliance. A user can come in and if they want to drill in to things that look like have either stalled or are non-compliant, Double clicking on any of those numbers will pull up the raw case file information so we can do data lookups, data cleanups, uh, continue quality improvement, QA stuff around the table with system actors. To the right of that is another example of kind of uh, what we call stock and flow or Mark Courtney and Fred Wilson out in shape and hall would call. So you get your dependencies flowing in, dismissals flowing out, active cases during a year on the purple line. Uh, filter for any county per population. This is a really great quick way to indicate pressures um, throughout the system uh, during different parts of the case time. Below that, we offer a lot more um, uh, sections based on outcomes and time to those events. And then the internal ID also has its own dependency dashboard. So the user can come in, select whatever timeliness indicators they want for state, FJCIP, or comparison up to uh, five counties. This is great for folks that wanna come in, get some quick data over time, print it out, take it to a judicial meeting um, or a systems meeting. So as Tammy mentioned, we, we still have some IT challenges that need to be addressed in developing the interface between the family system and the courts. Washington courts recently implemented a new statewide Odyssey case management system. However, two of the 39 jurisdictions, one being the largest county in the state, chose to either remain or transition to a non-Odyssey system. So it goes without saying that defining consistent data structures, elements, um, as well as outlining the data mapping, extracting for statewide reporting continues to be a struggle. However, the agency is committed in finding solutions as we look forward to CWIS and designing interfaces for better information um, and improved outcomes for children and families here in Washington State. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cindy Bricker, who's the Director of CIP for Washington. Hello, I'm Cindy Bricker. Thank you, Matt. And I am the Court Improvement Program Director with Washington State, working for Administrative Office of the Courts. And as Scott mentioned in the intro, CIP is about continuous quality improvement. And data is such an important part that a third of the grant funding that we get is specific to data collection and use. Washington CIP uses our data grant to pay for a senior research associate position with the Washington State Center for Court Research, which is Matt Orm, who you just heard from. We also used CIP funding to contract with the agency's research and data analysis division to examine court process timelines and its relationship with permanency related outcomes. Out of that, there were three key findings from that analysis that determined one, dependency cases in compliance with statutory guidelines had significantly shorter durations. Two, significant differences exist in the duration of dependency cases across courts and three racial and ethnic disparities in dependency length exist in nearly all courts for cases longer than one year. That let us know that the timelines that we were tracking, just as Matt showed you, really do make a difference. Uh, Matt showed you the different data products that we have available, and besides the individual users of the court child welfare data, including state legislators, 
there are two CIP groups that use the data to help direct their work. The first is the Innovative Dependency Court Collaborative, which is a statewide multidisciplinary group that's co-chaired by myself and the director of the Child Welfare Programs Division. This task force is required by the CIP grant. The group uses data to see where things are going well and to find out what these jurisdictions are doing differently and look for ways to grow that success. As Tammy mentioned, we are a decentralized court system, so each court does things a little bit differently you know, in each county. Um, we also use the data to look for areas that are struggling in order to offer resources to assist jurisdictions to improve their system, thereby improving outcomes for children and for families. Next slide, please. Uh, I also oversee the Family and Juvenile Court Improvement Program. And that program is state funded and it's in 10 out of our 39 counties. And each of those 10 courts hire a coordinator that regularly reviews the court child welfare data and shares with local stakeholder groups, similar to the IDCC, but done at the local level. Data shows that these programs perform better than the statewide average. FJCIP courts provide semi-annual reports that include dependency data for their individual jurisdictions, trends that they're noticing, and solutions they're planning to implement to resolve identified areas needing improvement. Information from these reports are used in the annual FJCIP report to the legislature. The FJCIP coordinators also participate in monthly online meetings where they share ideas. And using the CQI process that Scott talked about, several of these successful innovative programs have moved to statewide implementation. Next slide. Data is an integral part of systems change, and without it, how are we going to know what we are doing truly makes a difference in the lives of the children and families we serve? Here's our contact information, and we're happy to answer questions when it comes to that time. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, and there are a couple questions um, that have come in. Uh, but thank you, Tammy, Matt, and Cindy very much. Um, we're just going to go ahead now and move uh, to our Georgia panelist. Um, so I'm very uh, delighted to present to you uh, Judge Jerry Bruce. Thanks very much. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Um, as uh, you might have noted, uh, I'm a former uh, juvenile court judge, and before I was a juvenile court judge in the state of Georgia, I was an attorney for the Child Welfare Agency. Um, and so I've had a lot of different exposure to different aspects of uh, juvenile court practice in Georgia and I bring that uh, sort of practical knowledge of the courtroom into the my role as the court improvement program director for the state. One of the most important things that um, one of the most important tools I had available to me really as a judge, uh, I wasn't always aware of these options when I was an attorney for the state, uh, but really became aware of them unfortunately only after I got on the bench, was sort of robust approach to data that Georgia takes. Georgia is also a very decentralized system. If you can go to the next slide, you can see that, uh, first off, uh, Georgia has more counties than any state besides Texas, and we're much smaller than Texas. So we are, we are about as balkanized as a state that's not in the Balkans could probably be. Uh, we have 159 counties, uh, fortunately, we have a state administered child welfare system. I think if we were county administered, it would be utter chaos. Uh, we have a very decentralized court system. Um, so data, uh, overarching data can be hard to come by. And uh, fortunately, uh, the CIP program did two things and I completely neglected to uh, ask to include a slide about the first part. One is aggregate data about um, our child welfare system. That's very useful. Uh, for our court improvement program for our uh, we also have a court improvement initiative uh, that has about 15 or 16 jurisdictions in it who are committed to implementing best practices and we are very driven by looking at specific outcome data aggregate 
outcome data in those jurisdictions and also in any other jurisdiction that, that asks us to come and talk about those. So Georgia is one of only about 12 states uh, that completely shares openly all of its aggregate child welfare data that is reported to the federal government. Um, we do this in cooperation with uh, um, a program that's operated out of uh, North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, called fosteringcourtimprovement.org. You can look that up, fosteringcourtimprovement.org. You can see the states that share their data. Uh, Twelve states share their data with no protection whatsoever because it's all aggregate data. Georgia is one of those. Anybody with a web browser can pull up um, aggregate data on Georgia's uh, child welfare outcomes and measures. Uh, anything from um, the number of children we take into care in any given county, in any given region of the state. You can look it up by jurisdiction, by county, um, and by uh, uh, administrative regions of the state. Um, you can find out how many children go into care, how long they stay there, whether they're uh, brought in as part of a sibling group or not, um, when they're discharged, what type of placements they're in, how long it takes to termination of parental rights. There's hundreds of measures that every state's required to report to the federal government. And as I said, as part of our uh, partnership with our child welfare agency, more than 15 years ago, our CIP helped to broker an agreement to share that data completely publicly. And so it's available to anybody and we use that data. I have access not only to the to the front facing data, but to the raw data behind that um, and use that to build charts and graphs to assist our courts and other stakeholders in doing their job. So aggregate data is a very important driver for what we do in our work in Georgia. Uh, but also um, case specific data is very hard to come by. We, we have this highly decentralized court system. We have no uh, statewide requirement that our juvenile courts use any particular type of data system. We have juvenile courts who use uh, manila folders and yellow pieces of paper with a pen to take all, all of their notes and they have records uh, that are also just paper records. We have a lot of courts that digitize their records but they don't really share them. Um, I was the judge in a four county circuit up in the far right hand corner of Georgia, very rural uh, circuit that was cut in half by the Appalachian Trail and the mountains that are associated with that. And uh, it was very difficult to uh, carry files around from one county to another. So we, we had developed, if you can go to the next slide, uh, something called the court process reporting system. And this is for case specific data. So this, this is the result of a very innovative data sharing agreement between our judicial branch and our executive branch. The data sharing agreement itself is over 15 years old, but the court process reporting system has evolved enormously over the course of that 15 years. What it does essentially is it takes uh, all relevant data for every child in foster care and makes it available immediately. It's updated daily uh, to all of the stakeholders who deal with that child's case. So if I'm a judge in a multi-county circuit and I'm doing a judicial review because of timeframes, uh, on a case from County A while I'm sitting in County B, um, I don't need to have that child's court file, which is gonna have a lot of things that are probably extraneous to the decisions I have to make. Instead, I can pull that child up on CPRS and I can see everything uh, that's in our state uh, CWIS system, which is called SHINES, regarding that child's foster care stay. Uh, we'll go a little bit more into that um, in detail in just a little bit. So if also, this is the same thing as well. If I'm an attorney, um, I can pull up my child's uh, information and see exactly what's going on. If I'm an attorney for a parent, I can go in and see exactly what's going on with this case. We all know that case managers are difficult to get to and to uh, communicate with sometimes between court dates. Um, I don't have to get the case manager on the telephone. I can get updated information by pulling up the child's case on CPRS and seeing what's going on with it. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, we'll look at a little bit of the type of information that's uh, included there if you pull them up. Uh, you can do searches by the child's name, uh, by the relative or caregiver who's, from whom that child was initially removed, by the current case manager. Um, you can uh, highlight your own cases out of the raw data about children so that you have a, 
a window with your own cases so that you can go quickly to those. You can look at the case plans in detail um, uh, uh, about this uh, issue. You can um, find out what people are associated with the case, what, where the child's placed, the child's placement history, um, and you can look at court orders and other documents regarding that child. Um, we also have a data sharing agreement with the Department of Education in Georgia that allows us to have educational data um, for the child. And um, we also have, um, we also have um, a, 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 a data sharing agreement with the Department of Juvenile Justice so that if we have children who are dually involved, uh, we can pull up all of their accurate Department of Juvenile Justice information. Sorry, I was accidentally muted there for a second. So it's a, it's a large amount of information that's available about every child who's in foster care and it's updated daily. Um, could you skip to um, slide 40 really quickly, the next slide, and then we'll come back to slide 39. Um, we have a lot of uh, jurisdictions in which uh, the, the CASAs uh, upload their GAL reports to CPRS in advance of the hearing, so they're available there. That we've, we've worked with our Georgia CASAs uh, to build out the CPRS CASA reporting capability. Uh, they've made a more robust court report form that the CASAs can get online and fill out on CPRS so that once it's reviewed by their supervising staff, it's immediately published to everybody who has um, access to CPRS uh, on the case, which is all of the parties uh, uh, represented in those cases. Um, we can also run reports on uh, cases that have been recently updated. There's a large amount of case specific information in CPRS, so you can have a report run to just show which cases have recently been updated. Um, you can pull up a, a, a huge, uh, we have about 12,000 kids in care at the moment, so you can pull up an entire report of all the children in care. Um, recently updated documents, written transitional living plan reports, all kinds of specific reports. And we often create um, ad hoc uh, custom reports for other people as well uh, for different jurisdictions as they ask for those. Um, can we go back to 39, slide 39? Um, we also have an e-filing uh, process that's available in uh, CPRS that allows um, the, the attorneys for the agency in Georgia are called Special Assistance Attorney General, unfortunately, SAGs. Um, so if I'm a SAG in a case and I prepare an order, which is, that's the party who most frequently prepares court orders in cases, they can upload those to uh, the court process reporting system after showing those to all the parties and being aware that there's no other changes to be made. Uh, the court, when the court logs into CPRS, then sees that there are documents requiring the court's attention. The court can review those uh, court orders and either flag them and send them back for editing further or can sign those. And if the judge e-signs them, then um, they immediately go to the clerk who then can e-file them and they're available immediately to everybody um, in that party. Then that night, they go back to our state CWIS system so they're available to the state as well. We've had a large uh, issue over the past uh, several years with 4 e reimbursements because of court order availability, and this is helping to address that. We've also reached recently, as of uh, this past year, an agreement with our um, Attorney General's Office, who sort of runs the SAG program, and with our um, uh, child welfare agency uh, so that um, all of the SAGs in the state are required, even if they're not e-filing, uh, if the court's not e-filing, they're required to upload uh, copies of every single court order as soon as it's stamped and filed uh, to CPRS every day. Um, so we expect to really make some strides on court order availability uh, because the agency should have all of those court orders relatively up to date. Um, so it's a large amount of information that can be seen uh, by the parties to the case, and it's two-way communication between uh, the uh, CPRS between the state's uh, CWIS system and the local court system. Um, so I think that takes us to slide 41. So I pointed out the two-way courts, the, the, most of the information already on this um, and uh, the, the benefits of having this two-way communication. So I think that pretty much takes care of slide 41. I mean, slide 40, so we've got to, q and you can see it's a large amount of information. Georgia shares uh, both its uh, 
metadata, it's large aggregate data, uh, and makes available to the parties in the in individual cases and the courts a lot of detailed micro data about every child in foster care. So I see a I see a question. Is it okay for me just to look at the question and answer it, Phil? Yeah, sure. If you see one for you, go ahead. Um, I just see one that says, is data sharing between the courts and SACWIS in Georgia at the data elements level, or is it simply a PDF or other copy of the order itself? Um, it's a data elements level. I mean, now, now uh, if when a court order is uploaded, our state law requires documents that are uploaded uh, to state systems uh, for security purposes to be PDFs. So the court orders themselves are PDFs. Uh, but when you're looking at the elements of a child's case plan or you're trying to find out where the child's uh, currently placed or look at educational data, then you're looking at data elements uh, displayed on the screen, which change as they're updated uh, in the CWIS system or as they're updated from the court side. Thank you. Well, uh... One question for uh, Washington. You had mentioned that, um, I think this was Cindy, mentioned that uh, I think there was 11 projects locally that started locally have now moved to statewide. Are there any examples of that that you might be able to share with us? Um, sure, yeah, we've had several projects um, that have gone statewide. I don't know if it's 11, but several. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay, I might've heard 11, you said several, thank you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> So um, one of the examples would be our Finding Fathers project, um, which is um, the Finding Fathers project provides courts with reliable, fast, low-cost DNA testing for alleged fathers in dependency cases. And we had a pilot project where um, five courts, um, juvenile courts in Washington State, um, were provided um, these low-cost um, testing. So the CIP uh, program paid for the testing to happen to see if it would make a difference uh, in timeliness. Um, and so we, we measured using um, information that Matt tracks um, the difference in the median waiting time between a filing of dependency petition and then the DNA results prior to the pilot and then during the pilot by the, each court. And it was a significant um, amount of change. For instance, um, Pierce County went from 388 days to 71 days just by having this uh, project available. So then Pierce County, because it was so successful there and the way that they did it where they were actually swabbing in the court um, these alleged fathers. I think that that may change now that we've got this COVID stuff going on. <laughs> but um, anyway, they were able to track from the date petition filed, when the order was entered, when the sample was collected, when they got the results back, and then, and then back again. And it's a significant amount of savings if they're able to figure out who the father is at the at the beginning of the case versus waiting uh, until later. Um, because then they have to, to file uh, legal advertisements and those are expensive. So um, we were then able to go to the legislature, get funding to cover statewide implementation for this, um, which really it's only $66,000 per year. It's not very much money. And if you look at just the legal advertisements for the 1,200 cases uh, that, that we expect in a year's time statewide, um, that's like $480,000 just in the legal costs um, for that, not to mention time saved by attorneys and social workers who are trying to figure things out. So that was just one of the projects. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I wanted to just go back to uh, the Georgia team and, and open it up for Wendy. If you wanted to comment from the CWIS perspective on um, the partnership there in, in Georgia. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I did want to 
Wow, Judge Bruce has done a really great job um, talking about or speaking to um, the exchange that exists between the courts and the state SEWA system. Um, I did want to highlight that there are several benefits to to the data exchange. One, um, the, the ready access to key case information from reason for removal to permanency plan, caretaker relative information. Um, we send the diligent search, education, health, our visitation plan, um, and as he had mentioned, our written transitional living plan, and that's specific to our youth who are 14 years of age and older. Um, the all case information, case plan information is available to our citizen panel review, court clerks, CASA, judges, um, and as Judge Bruce had mentioned, our, our attorneys, both parent and child attorneys. For us, one of the key benefits is it improves our 4E outcomes, and he mentioned that as well. Um, you know, when we do our 4E redeterminations and redeterminations, our revenue maximization team have ready access to the court orders without having to request them from case managers, or, you know, um, it prevents delays with, with us waiting for them to be transmitted, you know, through mail. Um, so we have ready access to our, our court orders and ensuring that the court order language is there that's needed for 4E. For e. um, the other part, which I think is equally important, um, this will be my third benefit when it, when it comes to the data sharing between the courts and CWIS, is increased efficiency. Um, it reduces the amount of time that case managers have to spend actually requesting orders. Um, the actual hard, hard copies, then they are readily available. It gives them an opportunity to really focus on servicing children and families. And I also think it's a cost savings on both the court and the child welfare agency side. We no longer, I remember the days of having to um, make copies of court orders, and, I mean, case plans and, and making sure that we get signatures on multiple copies. And so we no longer have to have to do that. It's a lot more efficient for us. And lastly, um, it allows for us to securely share client information. So anytime we remove the paper, an actual hard copy, um, or trans, you know, transitioning from one person to another, um, it, it, it allows us to be able to, sh to do that in a more secure manner with sharing the data. So those are some of the notable benefits for um, what I think are, you know, for data sharing between our courts and, and CWIS. Um, and I don't know if, I don't recall, but, you know, we share more than 600 data elements between the three interfaces that exist between the courts and child welfare. So to Jerry's point, we share quite a bit of data um, between the two entities. That's amazing. Thank you, Wendy, for um, sharing that. Um, great. Let me uh, just um, read out a couple questions here. Um, it looks like there's a question that's come in. And I think this question is for uh, Jerry or for Georgia's team, um, are you consider, considering implementing a master data management or an MDM solution between the child welfare and court systems? And if so, which specific solution are you considering using? Thanks. And it may also be for Washington. I know in Georgia, we're not currently considering uh, anything beyond CPRS, which all courts already have access to, and which gives them access to all the information they want. It's free. I forgot to say that we, we developed this uh, pretty much from scratch uh, using contractors, like two contractors who run it. We didn't go to a software company. Uh, so the code is actually owned by the state of Georgia. It's open, it's open source. It's not like posted online, but it's free. We'll share it with anybody. Um, I think we just had a call yesterday with some tribal CIPs about the possibilities of using the underlying code and CPRS to assist them as well. Um, so we don't have any plans right now to move uh, off of CPRS uh, or to use any other type of software. We just sort of build out CPRS as we need to. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Tammy or anybody from Washington, do you want to address that? What I can say about that is that I am not actually part of our CWIS uh, development team. And yeah. so they would actually need to respond to that uh, later. But I'm guessing that 
kind of thing would be considered as we plan toward building out an interface, um, but we're still at those early stages. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Great. Let me just check here. Um, it looks like this question has come in. Is there data sharing between the courts and SACWIS in Georgia at I think we might have answered this at the data elements level, or is it simply, yes, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Judge, you did answer that one. Here's a new one. Uh, we're in, in uh, NEIM data models, you, we're, we're, I'm sorry, we're in EIM data models used for any, uh, any of the exchanges. And Alicia is um, wanting to jump in here. Yeah, I know that um, that, that was true in Colorado. Um, I'm not sure about Utah, though. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alicia. All right. That's the questions that I am seeing at this point, uh, unless any of you are seeing others. Okay. All right. Well, this is Nicole. Uh, there, was, there was one other question from um, Mr. Fred North. And I think this question was to the Washington team. I want to be sure that we don't miss it. His question was, are you considering implementing a master data management MDM solution between the child welfare and court systems? And if so, which specific software solution are you considering using? Thank you. Yeah, we, um, thanks, Nicole. Actually, yeah, Tammy did respond and, and let us know that that would have to be answered by the CWIS team. Um, the CWIS project manager and um, probably something they're considering at this time um, as they're in the early stages of their CWIS rollout. So, um, um, but Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to be sure we, we didn't. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate that. I do want to make sure that we do address all questions. Uh, there was another question that came in around um, the materials being available um, and uh, this uh, presentation is being recorded today. It will be posted on the ACF CB DSS website and should be available between two and four weeks after we um, uh, make it 508 compliant. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's about it on questions for now. Um, continue to um, uh, ask us, uh, again, continue to um, respond with questions or, or share questions. Um, and you can email us those if you have questions after this, just a few final thoughts. Um, and these are some things that we kind of heard from our presenters and our panelists today. Um, we'd encourage you, if you haven't yet engaged in a partnership with the court, um, to um, not think of it as a huge project and it has to be everything all at once. Um, it's important, just get started. You heard from uh, Judge Jerry Bruce that they started a partnership 15 years ago and they're building out to where they're at now, uh, but it takes baby steps. Um, you clearly heard um, the importance of relationships. Um, it's often said that uh, technology isn't, isn't the challenge, actually. It's really the trust and the relationships that's a, a larger challenge. Um, uh, we heard um, that collaboration is sometimes hard, but it's worth it, um, especially when we're able to really use the data, um, like you heard from Washington, and, and how they're um, driving decision making because of the availability of information. And we heard that from Georgian and, and the ability to make direct um, decisions about cases for children and families because they have the availability of the data. Um, there's an opportunity here. I think we heard that from Scott in terms of the CIPs. Um, um, this is a priority area for them. And so, um, um, you, again, build those relationships. There's clear opportunity. Um, and, and we heard this from Alicia too, be clear about the outcomes you're seeking um, to develop those shared outcomes. Um, what, do you, what do you mutually need together um, is, is important. And um, I think that uh, the last two final thoughts is that um, in collaboration, language really matters and being clear, um, Washington did a great job highlighting that, that this is one of their lessons learned is that um, be what you call certain things in one agency or discipline might be different in another. And so be clear on terms. Um, so language is important. And last one, uh, we can see from this that better outcomes um, can, can occur um, with this information exchange. Um, and those outcomes can be in, in the cases of children and families and, and additionally into, as a revenue. 
um, that we can um, increase, which again helps us to serve more children and families. Um, I want to turn to my panelists before I do wrap up to see if there are any final thoughts from you all. We have just a couple minutes. Um, if you have a final thought that you'd like to share before we close out today. Okay, not hearing any, we'll go ahead with a uh, wrap up today. Thank you again for attending this webinar. Um, we have an upcoming June webinar that will be on CWIS program and technology integration. So please look for that save the date and registration um, link. Um, again, we thank you all for attending and we thank you for the work you're doing on behalf of children and families. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar.